church. It is great to see you in God's house this morning. Thank you so much for coming out in spring, right? Spring in Wisconsin. We love it. You know, we got more snow today than we've gotten all winter. No, we got, probably not. But anyway, so glad to have you here. Thank you for braving the snow, coming out and being with us this morning. If you're visiting with us, we are so honored that you're here. Hopefully you got a bulletin when you came in. In the bulletin's a tab there. If you would fill that out and drop that in any of our offering ba- uh, boxes here, two in the back of the sanctuary, one on the way out the door, we'd greatly appreciate a record of your visit. Thank you for being with us this morning. And church, we have many that are joining us online this morning. Welcome them to our services this morning. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Well, obviously, you know what's coming up at the end of the week. Easter is coming. Uh, And so we have some special things going on that you need to be made aware of. First of all, Friday evening, 6.30, going to be a very special Good Friday service. You're not going to want to miss it. It's going to be very special. So I encourage you to come, bring a friend, invite them to come out there. And then on Easter, we have not one, but how many services? Very good. We have two services. Uh, the first one is at? 8.30. Oh, that was a little bit quieter. 8.30? 8.30? Well, K- Carrie's going to be here at 6 a.m. for anybody that wants to come and worship with her. 8.30 and then 10.30 will be our second service there. So plan on coming out. Invite a friend. Bring a friend uh, with you. If you have not had the opportunity to hand out... One of these cards, we still have some sitting on the desk out there. Grab one, two, three, give them out to anybody. Invite them to come out uh, there. Now, unfortunately, like we've said, we're not going to have Easter breakfast like we have, but we will have breakfast items and things like that. So you can still tell your family members, come on out, I'll get you some breakfast, right? And we'll have, we'll have great breakfast food here, coffee for sure, donuts for sure, stuff like that. Invite them out for that. Tell them you're paying right? And then bring them out and we'll have a great day. But we're so excited uh, for all that. So that's what's coming up this week. So make sure that you're prepared for that. Many other things in your bulletin. So I hope that you have a bulletin so you can be aware of all the things that are coming up uh, here in the near future. So great to see you this morning and be in God's house. Will you stand with me as we unite our hearts to worship God in his house today? Father God, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for your goodness. I thank you for everyone who is able to be with us and those that are able to join us online. Now, Father, I ask that you would uh, move in this time, move in this moment as we worship you in song. Lord, your word promises that you inhabit the praises of your people. And Lord, as we open your word to preach it today, Lord, to look at what it has for us, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would move and have freedom to work in the hearts of your people today. Father, God, bless this day and all that we do for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.
and co-heirs as his friends the scripture says that we are friends of the most high God how does that happen we get to be friends with God the 
scriptures tell us that that same God, our friend, our brother, our father, our redeemer, the all-powerful one, the all-knowing one, the one who saw the end from the beginning and the beginning from the end, that very same God is coming back to take us home. (laughs) He's coming for you (laughs) in the best way possible. Church, as we just sang, we have such great reason for rejoicing. We belong to him. We belong to him. How many times could we say that until it actually starts to sink in and we trust that that is the truth? We belong to him. And because we belong, we will live with him for eternity. Would you pray with me, Father? Oh, how glorious a thing. How undeserved a thing. That we are yours and because we are yours by your grace and your grace alone, by your plan seen from eternity past. And we will spend that very same eternity in your presence when you come to claim your own. When you say to the son, son, go and get my kids and bring them home. Oh, Father, with great anticipation, with great eagerness even, with great trust, we look to that day and we say, God, you are good and you are the only one who is good. So, Lord, as we now sing of that, help us, Lord, through this song, through this prayer that we are about to utter as we sing through it. God, help us to trust these things. We know you're coming. And we know you are glorious and will be glorified as you are seen coming on the clouds. We love you, Lord. Receive our praise. Be glorified. Be honored and be lifted high through and in the name of Christ.
So as a church body, we've been walking through uh, the book of First Thessalonians for some time now, and um, we've been singing through this song a lot. This is the last chapter of Thessalonians, simply First Thessalonians, simply put to to song and lyric, and, and we're just singing out the scriptures themselves. And church, what a what a powerful thing! It, it's one thing to proclaim these truths that that God, that Jesus is the lion and he's the lamb and he's coming back on the clouds for us, but what power there is to sing out the word, the very words of God, his heart revealed to man to sing these truths and to believe them with absolute assurance. I want to encourage you as, as we go into this song, as we lift these truths up, these, these truths of scripture that we're simply reiterating back to God, his word, him receiving it back, that you'd, you'd focus on these things that Paul walks us through, these simple directions for life. And the scriptures tell us that if we are to walk these things out, that if we are to walk in his statutes, the scripture tells us that we will live a blessed life, that others around us will live a blessed life, that we will walk closely with the Lord, and that he will have drawn near to us if we write these statutes on the tablet of our heart, as it says in Proverbs. So church, as we sing these words out now, let's do that. Let's, let's be intentional to let these be words that are true of our lives. Not for us, not for our glory, but for his glory. Thank you. 
Would you agree this morning that we serve an amazing, great God? Yes. Amen. Amen. Yeah, give Him praise. Give Him praise. Amen. Along with that, God has been greatly blessing us, and we're so excited for God's blessings. And the Lord's been bringing us several uh, new folks to our church, and we're so excited about that. Uh, but one demographic, if you will, that God's been bringing to our church is young families. And with young families comes children. And we love children, don't we, church? Amen? Absolutely. And the reason why I bring that up is we have a very strict rule here during our worship service about our kids. We want them to be children. Let them be kids. Okay? So parents that stress over, trying to keep the kids still or quiet or whatever, we just want you to relax, enjoy. We love kids. If your kid gets away, there's someone that will grab a hold of them and love on them. If they make it up here, then they just get to become a sermon illustration. Isn't that awesome? So uh, we'll get them to be a part of that. But no, seriously, we're so glad that you're with us and so glad that you're able to be here. And God is so greatly blessing. We are really at the very end of a series that we have been walking through in the, in the book of First Thessalonians entitled, Living for Christ in an Antichrist World. And so Paul has written this letter to the church of Thessalonica. And in doing so, the first half of the book, he laid out some doctrinal issues that he wanted them to know about, mainly their identity uh, in Christ, who they were in Jesus Christ. In the last half of the book, and where we're finishing up here today, he's dealing with practical uh, ways of us living and how we're supposed to live for Jesus Christ in this world in light of the fact that Jesus is coming again. Do you believe that Jesus is coming again? Amen. Well, Paul believed it in his day, and if we're this much farther from where Paul was, we know that we're closer. And so Paul is giving some last minute, some end uh, 
commands and comments that he wants to give to uh, the church there that apply to us as well. And we've walked through that. And the last few weeks now, Paul has been centering on God's will. And so two weeks ago, we asked this question here, what is God's will? What is God's will for our lives? And Paul gave us three commands within that that basically showed us his will. He said for us to rejoice always, to pray without ceasing, to give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So as a child of God who is uh, following the Lord Jesus Christ, who has accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, and is practically living out what God would have for you in your life, he says the characteristics of a person living in God's will should be one who rejoices always, who prays without ceasing, continually talking to God, and gives thanks in all circumstances, no matter what they are. But then last week we asked the question, since this is God's will, the next question is, how do we stay in God's will? What do we need to do in order to stay in God's will? Because the reality is, is that we can move out of God's will. And the thing that takes us out of God's will, obviously, is sin. And when we allow sin in our lives, we move out of that. So Paul told us plainly in this verse here to do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise prophecies or the Word of God. But test everything, hold fast to what is good, abstain from every form of evil. The word quench we saw last week says dousing out a fire. Don't put out the fire of the Holy Spirit. And the main way that we put it out is by despising prophecies. And we said that really talks about kind of telling the future. That's part of it. But the main thing is, is putting or despising the Word of God. In other words, knowing what the Word says but saying I'm going to do something else. I'm not going to follow or I'm not going to apply it to my life. But when we study the Word of God, we need to test everything to make sure that it is right and exactly what the Word has for us. And then we need to abstain or run from the appearance of evil. That's how we stay in the will of God. We don't allow sin to come in and to stay in our lives and to allow that to be in our lives. Now, Paul is going to move now and encourage us, and this is what he's going to give us today. Next slide, please. There you go. The power that sustains God's will. He gives us the power that sustains God's will. And he's going to lay this out for us in these last few comments that he gives to us. And he says right here in this verse, we'll look at the next verse here. He says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. How do we are, are sustained in God's will? He tells us, first of all, that God is the one who gives us the power to stay in God's will. Isn't that good? And we'll see that here just a, a little bit more. But God is the one who, when we choose to be in God's will, when we choose to uh, stay away from sin, God is the one that empowers us through the Holy Spirit to allow us to be able to live in God's will. And the word that he uses for that is the word sanctify. Now, that, that's a fun word, isn't it? What does that, that mean? I can give you the big 25-cent word, that sanctification. Doesn't that sound like I'm smart? Right? Okay? It literally means this. It means to be set apart. Same thing as holy. Sanctification and holiness are, are synonymous with one, one another. And that is this. As we live our lives for the Lord, we're to be set apart from the world and to be set apart unto God. In other words, for us to live in God's uh, will and to stay in God's will means that we need to live close to God. Doesn't that make sense? We need to be close to Him, be in His Word, and, and to uh, be sanctified. And God empowers us for that. But in order for us to understand sanctified, Paul really gives us a better word here to define that for us. And the word that he gives us is blameless. Now, wouldn't that be great? How would you like to live your life completely blameless? When I see blameless, I think to myself, sinless, woohoo! right? And then I'm reminded by so many in my life, I'm just not sinless. And I wish I was. I wish the second we accepted Christ as our Lord and Savior that we were sinless. But the word blameless there doesn't mean sinless, unfortunately, because, boy, wouldn't life be great if after, you know, you got saved, you never sinned again, right? The only problem with that is the sin of pride. 
right? Because if I could, if I could go without sinning, I'm going to be prideful about it, right? And then I'm sinning all over, all over again. It's not the fact that we're sinless. It's the fact that we keep short accounts with God. Or the idea is, is that when sin comes in and the Holy Spirit convicts us, He convicts us so that we get ourselves right or we take our sins to God asking forgiveness of our sin and repenting of our sin. And then living our lives by the power of the Holy Spirit to live according to the principles of the Word of God. I love how Paul does this because Paul says not only are we to be blameless, but look what he says here. He says, I want you to be completely that you you may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless. Isn't that do you realize that we are three parts, body, soul, and spirit? And the reality is, is that Paul says that through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can live sanctified or blameless in every area of our life. We can live blamelessly uh, in, in our soul, which is our mind, the way that we think. We can live blamelessly in our body by not choosing to do the sins that, that are out there. And we can live blamelessly in our spirit by us communicating and walking with God in a regular basis. And so Paul says here in our lives that the greatest thing that God wants for us to live is to live sanctified, to live blamelessly in this world. Now, why is this so important? What, this is God's will. Why is God so big on this in our lives? Well, it goes on to say this, to live blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, Paul says, this is how Jesus should find you as a child of God when he returns. He, you sh- God should find you as a child of God being saved a child of God being saved, repenting of your sin, accepting Him as Lord and Savior of your life. That's how, God should, that's how Jesus should find you when He comes. But then He also should find you living sanctified. And what's that? Blameless, as we saw the definition. Or, can I put it this way? Rejoicing always. Praying without ceasing. Giving thanks in all circumstances. Ensuring that you're not allowing sin in your life so you quench the Holy Spirit listening and applying God's Word to your life on a regular basis, testing it to make sure that what you hear in preaching and teaching and and all these other ways, that you are making sure that it is the Word of God, that you're living according to the Word of God and run from all appearances of evil. That's what Paul says we should look like and what a child of God should look like as Jesus comes back for us. Question. How you doing? How you doing in this area? If you were to take an inventory right now and Jesus was to come back right this moment, where would you be? Can I be the first to tell you I've got some things to work on? Right? You say, Pastor, no, you're the pastor. I'm human. I know you guys put me on a pedestal because I'm on the platform here. So <laughs> higher up. You and me, same journey in this thing. Isn't that good? But when Jesus comes and when he does return, How will we look? How will we be when he comes again? And here's the real rub, if you'll let me do that or say that word. We can't do this in our own power. In my flesh, in myself, guess what? I barely rejoice, right? How many of you had a bad day this week? Right, you kind of let 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 the uh, things go, how things were, and you're in, in the flesh. And when I'm in the flesh, there's not a whole lot of rejoicing going on. There's praying because usually that's repenting at that point for me in my life. Right? <laughs> oh God, forgive me. But then when I'm in the flesh. I don't give thanks for things. There's a lot of things in this world I don't like. How about you? Right? And without God in my life, working in my life, I don't see a whole lot of positives a lot of times. Do I? My, my family, I, I'm gonna, I guess I'm getting too personal here, but my family nicknamed me or, Eeyore. <laughs> As a matter of fact, one of my daughters, when they were really young, I don't know where it is now, bought me a little stuffed Eeyore to keep uh, in, in my office to remind me that, that uh, I can be the person in my own flesh that always has the rain cloud over them, right? And it and just woe is me and I... Um, I'm not going to do the imitation now, but sometimes when I'm really in the mood, I can really sound like him as well, right? (laughs) You know why? 
Because I can't live this life in my own strength, and neither can you. And that's why Paul finishes uh, with this saying, He who calls you is faithful. He who calls you is faithful. And I love, I love how Paul makes sure that we understand what faithful is. Because he gives us a definition of faithful. You know what that is? He will surely do it. Praise God. God will do it. God is the one that gives us the strength and the power. That's why we have the Holy Spirit residing inside of us that as we walk this life and we recognize that we can't do these things on our own, that God's the one that strengthens us and empowers us so that we can walk and live in God's will. And it's a daily battle. For, for, for many of us, including myself, it's a minute-by-minute battle, right? Of completely surrendering to God, continually surrendering to Him and letting Him know that I need you to empower me so that I can rejoice, I can pray, I can give thanks. To not quench the Spirit and not despise the preaching of God's Word. And so that I can uh, abstain from all appearances of evil. So that I can be in God's will. Because there's nothing more important in my life. There's nothing more that I want right now in my life. That when Jesus comes and he is coming. And his return is imminent. could be at any moment. That when he comes, he sees me in the center of his will. And I hope that's what you are looking for it. I hope that's what you are striving to walk in. And the reality is, is that we can try to do it, we can try to do it, we can try to do it, but we can't. So what that means is we have to surrender. We have to surrender to the Holy Spirit. We have to say, do this in me. I surrender to you that I can walk this way and I can live this way. And then when we surrender to the Holy Spirit, when we allow God to do this work in us, Paul concludes now his letter by giving us some symptoms of what it looks like to be in God's will. These aren't necessarily commands as much as they are, listen, this is what's going to pour out of you. And I really love how he just kind of finishes off. He says, brothers, pray for us. In other words, what he's saying is that when you're walking in God's will, you will be prompted by the Holy Spirit to pray for one another. Now, he says for us, and of course, that's praying for your spiritual leaders and those who are in leadership. That's absolutely true. But he's also saying us because he's referring to all of us. We're in this together. We're walking this journey together, and we need to be praying for one another. Remember, in, uh, earlier in the letter, Paul talked specifically about us praying and encouraging one another in prayer. Not only physical prayer. We're really good at that. When someone is sick or someone has a need, we pray for them, and that's so vitally important. But Paul says it needs to go deeper than that. We need to be praying for one another's spiritual walk, one another's spiritual journey. You know what? Satan doesn't care if you get healed physically. He doesn't care if you are better after you get sick. But what he doesn't want is he doesn't want you to be spiritually healthy. He doesn't want you walking close to the Lord. And I think that should be more our primary prayer than anything. Is Lord, pray for one another. Lift each other up. And, and Lord, help them to walk close to you. Help them to be in your will. Lord, let them rejoice in all of these things and, and give thanks in circumstances and not quench the... This is what we need to be praying for one another. Lifting each other up, especially in the days that we are living in, that we are building each other up in prayer. Uh, and this is a fun one. This one is where we're all like, wait a minute, what, what's going on here? He says, not only, but a symptom, this is a symptom now of you walking in the, in the will of God. And you might go, wait a minute, I don't know if I want this or not. But he says, greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. With a holy kiss. Yeah. Amen. All right. How many of you recognize right there when you read that, that's cultural? <laughs> right? We still have this in our society today. There's other places in the world where a person will greet each other by, you know, a kiss on each cheek like that. That's how, that's how they greet each other, but not in Manly, USA, baby, right? <laughs> and so what is he saying? The, the byproduct, the, the, the symptom of us being in God's will is that we greet one another and we're excited to see one another. We're happy to be around each other. We're, we're eager to greet and be with one another. We should look at being together as a body of believers as something that we're excited about, especially every week. I hope and pray you look forward to being here on Sundays. 
I hope and pray you look forward to being with your church family when we gather together. I, I hope and pray that you're like, man, I can't wait to get and be with them because that's what God produces in us when we're walking in His will so that we pray and we are excited to see each other. And then Paul gets specific here about his letter. He says, listen, I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. And so what is he saying? He's saying, I, I want you to make a commitment that you're going to share this letter, 1 Thessalonians, which we have done in these past several months. But what's he saying? What he's literally saying here is, I want you to encourage each other with the Word of God. I want you to build up each other with the Word of God. Can I be honest? Church, sometimes we're really good with gotcha verses, aren't we? Right? Right? We're really good at knowing what, what verse that goes against that sin and how, how if we just throw that verse at them, it's going to you know, guilt them and they're maybe going to get it right. No, that's not what God says for us to do. He says to build each other up in the Word of God, to build each other up. Yeah, we deal with sin. Don't misunderstand me. We're not, we're not uh, skirting sin underneath the rug. But we need to be about encouraging and building each other up with the Word of God. We need to be uh, helping each other walk. And then he gives this last salutation, the grace of our, God, of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. When we pray for one another, when we greet each other and excited to be with one another, when we build up each other in the Word of God, God's grace pours out of us. And that's what we're to be about. That's our saying here at, at MCC that we want to be grace points, that we are the point at which God's grace flows from us into one another and into the world. And that is God's will for us. So I want to ask you this morning, I want you to think about the fact that Jesus is coming. We just sang about it, that the Lord is coming again. And when He comes again, will you be ready in other words, do you know the Lord is your personal Savior? Have you by faith repented or asked God to forgive you of your sin? Put your faith and trust in His death, burial, and resurrection and ask Him to be Lord of your life. That's the first step of being in God's will. You say, yes, I've done that. Then if you have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, are you living a sanctified life? Are you living blameless through the power of the Holy Spirit? When Jesus returns, will He find his faithful servant. Will Jesus be able to say with all excitement, well done, good and faithful servant. So can I leave you with this? Be living in God's will when Jesus returns. He's coming. We're not guaranteed the rest of this day. If Jesus was to come right now, would you be like, oh yeah? Or would you be like, oh my? Right? I mean, sure, we would be, oh yeah, because we have a relationship with Him. We're going to be with Him. But I pray in my life that when Jesus comes, He'll find me in the center of His will. And I pray that for you as well. Be sure that you're living in God's will. When Jesus returns, will you stand with me in God's house today? Father God, I thank you so much for the truth of your word. And God, I thank you for all who are here today. If there be one person here that would say they don't know you as Lord and Savior, I pray, Father God, that right now in this moment, in the quietness of this moment, Lord, they would say, God, forgive me of my sin. By faith, Lord, I put my faith and trust in you. And the best way I know how, I ask that you come and be Lord of my life. And Lord, I pray that if they by faith would do that, we thank you that you're a God that saves. Oh, but God, I pray for our family here today. Lord, we know you're coming, and it's very soon. Oh, God, would you search us? Holy Spirit, will you search our hearts in areas where we have not been living according to your perfect will? Will you cleanse us and forgive us? And Lord, will you help us and prompt us and move us to surrender to you so that you can live this out in our lives, I pray. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, sing it.
benediction today, just a brief reading from God's word on this Palm Sunday where we celebrate the triumphal entry of Jesus into the city as people began to lay down palm branches and they said these words, uh, this, this one particular word that is both a plea and a prayer and it's from Matthew 21 during the triumphal entry, the crowd cried, Hosanna, Hosanna which means save us. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Church, may God bless you this week as we enter into Resurrection Sunday and remember that the Lord has died for a people unworthy of his death. And let the cry of our heart be this week the same as the crowd that day. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Church, God bless you. Have a great week, and we will see you.